Thank you very much, Paul. Um, uh, this talk is um, is going to be um, uh, it will be uh, described some survey work I was involved in uh, two years ago uh, in West Galway, and you know it was a survey of uh, this fantastic uh, species you see on your right, uh, Spiranthes rumens of Africana, which is uh, a very rare species in Ireland. Uh, the survey was commissioned by the National Parks and Wildlife, uh, Dr. Mike Wise Jackson in particular, and was carried out uh, in association with Botanical Environmental Consultants, or BEC. And the field work was undertaken uh, two years ago, uh, between late June and early August in 2019, when uh, people could get out and survey without having to be aware of where the guards were and that sort of thing. But um, so uh, could you turn on to the next slide, Jim? Thanks. OK, this first slide uh, basically is an introduction to the species in Ireland. It was first uh, seen in Ireland around 1810, uh, around uh, 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 Bay in County Cork. And uh, since then, it's been slowly discovered in other parts of Ireland. Uh, it, was, it was seen first seen around Loch Ney in 1892, and the first Galway record was quite late uh, in 1958 near Loch Corrib. Uh, as opposed to most orchid species, it, it, it flowers fairly late in the year, uh, typically between late June and early, early August, uh, which is uh, quite unusual. Uh, and the flowers are generally uh, between 10 and 20 centimetres tall, although sometimes you do get uh, ones which are a bit taller than that. Um, uh, on the, in the bottom left photograph there, we see um, uh, a photograph of the species, uh, a nice tall fl a fl a ring spike of the species growing on the shores of Loch Conn. Uh, and on the right is quite an unusual thing to, uh, in, in my survey. I didn't see too many of these, but it just shows you the uh, a flowering spike as it just uh, comes comes out of the of the ground. Um, it's a very inconspicuous species when it's not in flower, uh, as you can imagine, because it's the same green as a lot of the other bit vegetation. Uh, next slide, Jim. Thanks. Okay, uh, one of the most striking things about Aranthus is that it's got a, a very unusual distribution. It's an amphi Atlantic, it's got an amphi Atlantic distribution, which means uh, most of the, the, the species mainly occurs in uh, the, the US and Canada, and there are uh, smaller populations on, in this side of the world. Uh, I'm not so sure about that, uh, the, the, that actual dot in the middle of the Atlantic. I think it maybe a bit of a um, mistake. But uh, the, the the map on the right shows the, the, the current distribution of the species in Ireland and Britain. As you can see, it's uh, scattered along the west coast of Ireland, uh, Cork, Kerry, uh, Galway, and, Eo, and there's a large concentration around Loch in the, in the north of Ireland. And in Scotland, it occurs along the west coast, and in the last couple of years, uh, a site has turned up for it in Wales as well. So it's got a, got a quite a widespread uh, western and northern distribution in this part of the world. Uh, next slide, Jim. Thanks. Hello. Yes. Uh, now we'll uh, just talk a little bit about the all and Mayo distribution. Um, uh, in the past, it's been uh, recorded from about 12, 10 kilometer squares in Galway and Mayo, and it's uh, been seen in most of those 10k squares over the last uh, few years. Uh, the species has a very specific uh, uh, this is where it likes to grow. It's confined a lot, a lot largely to the stony margins of, of fairly large lakes in the, in, in the region. Um, and it seems to be confined to the large lakes. It doesn't uh, seem to occur in small lakes for some reason uh, to, to any great extent. It's mainly on base poor uh, rock, such as sandstones and granites, such as Loch Mask. But you also get some populations on the, on, on, 
on the line which uh, the, the rock as well, such as lock cover. And the main habitats of these species are, 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 are she wet grassland and calcareous fen. And it's fairly specifically uh, confined to those sort of uh, parts, lakes. Uh, next slide there, Jim. Yeah, for the next couple of slides, I just want to show you uh, a few places in which the, uh, the plant species grows. Um, on the left, we see a, a shot from Loch Con in, in, uh, in Timeo, which shows uh, a sort of a, ca a calcareous fen um, uh, part of the lake, and the species grows on thin fen peats. Um, whereas on, uh, on, the, on the picture on the right hand side is uh, a shot from the western shore of Loch Mask, and here the species grows on uh, uh, wet at grassland uh, vegetation, which is raised above the above the level of the lake, lake to some extent, and there's lots of outcropping rock and, uh, and stone as well. So, so it, even though it's confined to, to, to lake edges, it can uh, occur in slightly different um, types of sites. Uh, next slide, Jim. Thanks. Uh, here's another two lake. Uh, Lake examples of where where it actually grows. Uh, on the on the left there, you see the shot of the northern shore of Loch Arab, and the species grows in a uh, you know, very stony uh, limestone uh, part of the lake here, uh, very very thin soils, and um, it's it's quite an unusual place for it to be growing. It doesn't doesn't really occur in too too many places like this. In the in the rest of the um, of the of the region, and the on on the right we see uh, a shot of where it grows in on the on the western shores of Loch Con, uh, typically uh, low growing wet grassland vegetation a few meters back from the lake edge. Okay, and next slide, associated soils. Well, I suppose the main thing to say about associated soils is that there isn't very much soil uh, associated with the species. Uh, it generally grows on th damp, thin soils, which have a low or or organic content. And it also grows on calcareous fen peat as well, which is also very, very thin. Um, the, the, the photograph on the right there um, just shows you a shot of the species, a flowering spike, the species growing in Loch Con. And you can see lots of stone with Purple moor grass growing there, and uh, uh, water mint as well. So that gives you a good impression of uh, the sort of, sort of places it can grow. And a striking uh, fact about the species in in the, in the region is that it's, it's usually within five meters of the of the water's edge. Uh, the vast majority of the of the of the populations I saw were confined to that uh, that sort of five to ten meter strip. Sometimes you might like it a few. Uh, a few plants growing beyond that. And it's, as I said, it's mainly confined to uh, very, very shallow soils. Uh, the next couple of slides, I just want to show a few examples of um, this sort of uh, pl plant vegetation that the uh, species grows in. The, the most common uh, places they grow is, is a sort of a marsh at grassland habitat which is quite low growing and is often grazed. Um, there's often a fair bit of bare soil, about 10 to 20% sometimes, uh, but sometimes it's a bit lower than that. And the number of plant species in a two by two uh, quadrat is about 17 species. So it's, uh, it's quite species rich. Uh, and the main associated species are typically purple moorgrass, common sedge and crooked and bent along with the a range of other other wetland uh, plant species. Uh, the the photograph on the right there just shows you um, um, the, uh, how small the, uh, the the flowering heads can be. Uh, so they they are quite easy to miss. Uh, next slide, Jim. Thanks. Okay. The other other places you find uh, the species growing in are areas of fen, a bit is rich fen. And this vegetation is, uh, is, is quite tall, 
um, usually between 20 to 40 centimetres, and it's got a much higher cover of uh, bare soil and stone, uh, around 44%, but it's got quite a large range. And the number of species, again, uh, is, is quite high at 19. Uh, the main associated species in this vegetation is the, is the black buck or rush, which you can see in the, uh, in the, the photograph, and also lots of purple moor grass uh, as well. And you, you also get uh, lots of jointed rush, creeping bent and bog in Purnell uh, as well. And the, the final thing to note about this, this sort of plant community is that uh, there, there's usually a good cover of the, of the brook on moss species, uh, Campylium stellatum and Scorpidium revolvens. Uh, next slide, Jim. Okay, one of the main uh, things we were trying to do in the survey is to, is to see how the, 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 the population size actually changes over, um, over time. And there, there was a, sur a survey of any of these populations carried out in the early 2000s. And uh, so I went back to uh, at least 14, uh, about, about 14 of these uh, uh, populations again to see if they were still there and what size they were. So the table on the left shows you the, the early 2000s uh, survey. And on the right there, there's a couple up which showed um, what I uh, refound. Uh, of the 14 sites which were resurveyed, the species were not refound at five sites. But I think this is uh, possibly um, it gives you a, a wrong impression of the of the uh, of the sites. Um, the, the fact that I couldn't uh, re refine the species is probably due to a number of factors, such as uh, the fact that there there was only six for good references in 2005. So you weren't sure if you were exactly in the same location, and also there's some sites that were really heavily grazed uh, at the sites where the the um, species was not refound. There wasn't much obvious signs of the of the area being disturbed, although two sites were intensively grazed. In general, there was much lower numbers seen in 2019 than in the early 2000s, and I'm not quite sure why that might be. It could show that there are the the numbers are actually uh, reducing at some sites, but it also could just have been a poor year for the species uh, that does happen. And the final thing to note there is that uh, future surveys will will be will be easier to compare uh, if you do if you, uh, another survey another ten years because uh, during this survey in 2019 we recorded more accurate ten figure grid references so uh, uh, hopefully uh, we can go back to these populations again um, next slide again Jim. Yeah, this is my last slide and during the course of my survey I just uh, just decided to note the main threats which uh, appear to be to occur for the species um, and there are three main ones I suppose uh, the first one is overgrazing of the lake shore and the adjoining land and that was seen at three sites and it's mainly sheep grazing and uh, the uncontrolled sheep grazing can obviously uh, affect uh, the, the the species, especially when it comes to putting up a, a flower spike. Um, there's also a two sites. There was also um, quite a lot of development of boating infrastructure along the lake shore, and I'm just talking here in, the, in this case about uh, boats being pulled up onto the lake shore. Even even though there were small boats, the uh, the associated traveling and uh, Sort of car access can also um, uh, it can also be bad for the for the species and the vegetation in which it grows, and there's also two sites where uh, tractors were seen very close to a couple of the um, of the of the population. So, so tractor movements along the lake edge are obviously uh, not great either for the species. Uh, last slide, Jim. Thanks. Uh, thank you for listening. It's been great, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to go out and have a look at these uh, these populations again in the future.